Yeah. In a right triangle, given two sides. Use the Pythagorean theorem you can find. Unknown value, so you have three. Label all the sides with an A, B, and C. Yo, looking for the C? This is where you find me. In this last video of this lecture, I want to talk about two additional issues related to uh, the Hilbert basis theorem and some of the material in section 9.6 of Dominant Foot. All right, so what did this theorem say? R is a commutative ring with identity. If R is Noetherian, so is the polynomial ring R bracket X. Well, what else can you say in that direction? And the theorem that I want to highlight is that if R is Noetherian, then so is the power series ring R double bracket X. How does the proof go? Well, it has to be different. Why? Because the whole thing that made both of our proofs of Hilbert's basis theorem work was we have a bunch of polynomials in I, and we take the leading coefficient of each. We take a collection of leading coefficients, either the ideal generated by all of them, or just all of the leading coefficients of the uh, polynomials in I, and we get an ideal in R. So why does that proof not work the same way here? Because a power series doesn't have a leading coefficient. There doesn't have to be a largest non-zero uh, x term in a power series, right? Like the powers of x can get arbitrarily large. But there does have to be a smallest term, a term of smallest degree. So it doesn't have a leading coefficient, but it does have a coefficient of its lowest degree non-zero term. And you can kind of flip this argument around and adapt it to this setting. So I won't give you the details, but I'll give you a reference uh, to a proof of this fact on the course website. OK, so another thing is we said that if R is no theory, and then so is R bracket x. And then by induction on the number of variables, so is uh, R bracket x1 up through xn, the polynomial ring in n variables. But what if you take the polynomial ring in arbitrary many arbitrarily many var variables? I didn't mention that when we talked about the Hilbert basis theorem, uh, because the argument doesn't work here because the corresponding statement is just not true. This ring is like the one example of a ring where we've seen an ideal that is not finitely generated. right? So our, our first example was you take r equals q, and you take the ideal generated by all of the xi's, x1, x2, up through you know, uh, all x1, x2, dot, 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 dot. Uh, that that was our example of an ideal that's not finitely generated. So this polynomial ring in arbitrarily many variables is not Noetherian. And in fact, it is the one example that I keep around of like the main example, the easiest place to find an ideal that's not finitely generated. OK, so uh, I want to talk about one other thing about the proof given in dominant foot of Hilbert's basis theorem. So let's say that f is a field. And let's take the ideal generated by, let's say, xy plus 1 and y squared minus 1. That's an ideal in f bracket xy. So uh, a field is certainly Noetherian. So f bracket xy is also Noetherian. Um, OK, so what can we say about uh, ideals in here, polynomials in here? Well, one kind of question we could ask is, OK, uh, f is a field. f bracket x is a Euclidean domain. So it has a division algorithm. So if I give you a polynomial in one variable, and I ask, is it in an ideal in this ring, it's pretty easy to see what to do. You apply the division algorithm, and you see if your remainder is 0. But here we have this polynomial ring in two variables. We have this ideal generated by two things. And you can ask, OK, here's a polynomial, x times y squared minus x. Is it in this ideal, or is it not in this ideal? And what you would try is something like a division algorithm. right? So I have these two different polynomials in here. And what do I mean try a kind of division algorithm? If I want to write this polynomial, x, y squared minus x, as this first polynomial, x, y plus 1 plus something, some kind of remainder, what I would do is figure out what do I have to multiply this polynomial by to cancel out the main term of this polynomial, x, y squared minus x. So OK, you think about it. And you can see that x, y squared minus x equals uh, x, y plus 1 times
times y. So now this product is xy squared plus y. So you subtract the xy squareds cancel, and you're left with minus x plus y. OK, so is xy plus 1 in this ideal i? Maybe. It certainly is if x plus y is in this ideal i. And that's not so clear. OK, well, what if you did it in the other order? And you said, OK, I'm going to try to write xy squared minus x as y squared minus 1 times something. Do you see that xy squared minus x is y squared minus 1 times x, because you want the xy squared to cancel out. And then uh, we get kind of lucky, plus 0. So OK, you divide by y squared minus 1. And now it's very clear that xy squared minus x is in this ideal i. But if you did it the first way, it's not so clear. So the thing that's going on here is you have to be careful. There are two different kinds of divisions you could do. And you have to be careful about the order that you do them in. Because in the first way, you get a remainder that is minus x plus y. And in the second way, you get remainder 0. So these remainders change. So what does this problem look like uh, in general? Is you have some ideal i generated by f1 up through fm in a polynomial ring in n variables. Let's say n is at least 2, because otherwise this is not so interesting. And then you just have another polynomial in this polynomial ring in n variables. And the ideal membership problem asks, is g in this ideal i? How do you compute that? How do you figure out if it's in the ideal or not in the ideal? And there's some kind of subtle stuff going on here. I said what you want to do with these divisions is you want to multiply by the appropriate thing to cancel out the main term of your polynomial. But if you have a polynomial in a bunch of variables, it's not clear what the leading term should mean. You know, like if you have a polynomial that's x to the fifth plus x cubed y cubed, which one of those is the leading term? Is it x to the fifth or is it x cubed y cubed? And this depends on some kind of choice. So how do you solve this problem? What's the idea? Uh, one big idea is to say, OK, i is the ideal generated by f1 up through fm. But that's just one generating set for this ideal. There are many, many generating sets. And we can find a new better generating set that we build out of this initial generating set that's going to make it much clearer whether or not g is in this ideal or not. And that is the thing that Dummett and Foote are moving towards in section 9.6 is the theory of these Grobner bases, the idea of taking a generating set that you start with and producing a better one that helps you to solve lots of computational problems in algebra and algebraic geometry. So I think the proof of Hilbert's basis theorem given in Dummett and Foote is a little more complicated than the first proof that we gave for two reasons. One, we are using a thing that Dummett and Foote haven't yet proven at this point in the text. But two, they're also setting up this proof to hint at what's coming later in the section, and particularly about the construction of the Grobner basis of an ideal and a statement that, given an ideal, a Grobner basis for it actually exists. So we won't talk about Grobner bases further in Math 206. Uh, I would highly recommend that you check this out if you're interested. This is one of my favorite things in all of mathematics. Um, I don't want to oversell, but like it's totally the best. There are very many uh, computational problems in algebra and algebraic geometry that are made much simpler by starting with an ideal and then producing a Grobner basis for that ideal.